Good morning. Um, thank you, Kate, for the introduction and congratulations to all our amazing faculty. Um, I'm so proud to be part of this division. Um, so thank you uh, for inviting me to speak about um, the kidney liver program today um, at the University of Washington. So for those who don't know the kidney liver program, it's a special program that was launched um, in September of 2016 by Carrie Payne and myself, um, and it really caters to patients who are very sick. They have really sick livers, usually end-stage liver disease or acute liver failure, and they have concomitant renal failure. Um, and um, it, we recognized over the years that it was a particularly tricky patient population to take care of. And the decision was made to launch a special program addressing the special needs for these patients. Um, and let's see if I can advance the slide. So when we launched this program, Carrie and I, uh, there was a number of different aims that we tried to um, implement. First, we were thinking that improving communication between these teams. So these are highly complex patients with multiple teams that are involved. So we thought if the teams could communicate better, uh, that we could hopefully uh, affect patient outcomes uh, we worked on a number of different treatment approaches. We'll focus on uh, just three of them today. And then the hope was that by doing all these things, we would improve patient care and outcomes for patients with concomitant liver and kidney failure. Um, what we're not going to be able to talk, talk about today is that um, we were hoping also to improve fellow experience. Those were particularly tricky patients that would take a lot of time for the consult fellow. And so taking that away from the consult service um, hopefully improved fellow experience. And then we were obviously aiming to generate expertise and academic enrichment as well. So we started out with sort of a culture shift um, uh, and we thought we would improve communication and collaboration with three different interventions. Um, first of all, um, we started joint rounds where we would round together with transplant surgery um, surgical ICU, if possible, medical ICU, hepatology, bedside nurses, and pharmacy. So multiple people at the table. And the thought was that we could, by improving this, this exchange of what each team and silo is concerned about, we would sort of overall improve our understanding on how to manage these patients better. Um, we launched um, what was called liver huddles. It's a twice a week uh, multidisciplinary meeting uh, between the internal medicine teams who take care of these patients in the hospital, hepatology and KLP. And it would be sort of an exchange of, of, um, of, of management ideas, um, but it also would be, you know, concerns would be raised. And a lot of times we would end up with new consults from that conference of patients that maybe they were thinking about consulting, but didn't quite pull the trigger. And then third, um, Carrie and I um, would participate in, in a liver transplant selection conference where we would talk about the top 10, the sickest meld patients um, and talk about management updates. And so everybody was up to date and up to speed on what was happening with these patients. And then we did a number of different treatment uh, changes that we initiated. I'm gonna focus on three of them today. Um, first of all, volume managements for liver transplant patients pre and post liver transplant. So if you see here the Michelin or Michelin man, right? Um, you can't be the Michelin man and, and successfully go into a liver transplant. You need to do a little bit better. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. The second big emphasis, emphasis we, we launched uh, was reversing what was called hepatorenal syndrome at the time, which is now HRS AKI with norepinephrine. That was a change that hadn't been done before. And then another uh, treatment approach was aggressively treating hyperaminemia in patients with liver transplants uh, with, with acute liver failure. And that's really something that was spearheaded by Kerry. So let's start out by talking about volume management uh, in these liver transplant patients. So volume overload is very common in cirrhosis. Not only do they carry sometimes 20 or 25 liters of ascites with them, it's probably the least of their problems because that gets drained with a liver transplant, but they also have other forms of significant ECV excess. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is fully turned on uh, in these liver patients and they're very sodium avid. And so they end up 
with a lot of extra fluid on board. And as, as the majority of you know, fluid overload is not a good thing. So here is data to support that. Uh, fluid, fluid overload, for instance, in patients with acute kidney injury has a twofold risk of mortality uh, in patients uh, that have acute kidney injury. And even worse, if you are a surgical patient uh, and you're fluid overloaded, your odds ratio of dying is about sixfold. So very significant uh, worsening of outcomes in these patients. And, and I have to say sort of grounding with transplant surgery has, has uh, raised our sensitivity to this issue. Um, here's just brief data, not great data, but okay data looking at the evidence that fluid positive, like a positive fluid balance in the first four days after uh, a liver transplant is associated not only with a significant risk of acute kidney injury, but also uh, a significant risk for, uh, for requiring renal replacement therapy. Some of those, you know, you will, may ask yourself, what's the chicken and the egg here? But, but fluid overload um, is, is very, very uh, challenging for this patient population. And so what we had to do, and I have to say, I, I, I've been guilty of this before, we all have this, this nephrocentric view. Um, the solar system is obviously circulating around the kidney, right? We would uh, always have have the um, aim of improving the kidney numbers by maybe, you know, giving a little extra albumin by maybe holding diuretics um, to make our creatinine improve, but we would lose track of all these other planets that are circulating around the kidney. So we would shift from uh, this nephrocentric view to maybe a more patient-centered view um, to pay attention to volume status and ideally accomplish that with working kidneys. So not by totally turning off the kidneys, but working with the kidneys. Um, and we were hoping that by doing that, we would improve uh, liver transplant recovery. So for instance, here on the right-hand side is one of our liver transplant recipients who is ambulating uh, with physical therapy uh, in the surgical ICU within half a day of being extubated from a liver transplant. So, so if you carry 50 extra pounds of fluid around with you, it's a lot harder to get extubated quickly um, or to start moving around um, to go home. So volume management was one of the things we focused on. The other thing that we focused on was uh, turning the kidneys around, reversing hepatorenal syndrome, or now called HRS AKI with norepinephrine, which really is something that we hadn't done before we launched a service. And it required befriending uh, and, and forming strong relationships with the ICU team because we would tie up um, ICU beds by putting these patients on norepinephrine. And I wanted to run you through a, a recent patient. This is a patient, a 62-year-old Alaska native lady who we recently transplanted. And, and I remember taking over her care on a Monday morning and her and as you can see, so she was admitted for expedited liver transplant workup, was approved, was listed. I come on on a Monday morning and her creatinine is three and I'm, I'm having a slight panic attack. Now her mild is 40 and the, liver, the, the, the transplant surgeons are saying, hey, you know, we're going to start to get offers on this lady. She looks terrible. What are you going to do about this? So we asked our friends in the MICU to start the patient on norepi. And you can see that her creatinine sort of improved very quickly, um, um, and but more importantly, we were able to start to diurese her. So we started norepi, she started peeing, we added diuretics, and you can see here is the fluid balance the day prior to her liver transplant. She had diuresed six liters uh, of urine with improving kidney function, right? So we had diuresed about 20 pounds off of her in the ICU. She got the liver off her. She went to the operating room with a creatinine of 1.8, and made two and a half liters in the operating room, came out of the liver transplant surgery with a creatinine of 1.4, um, and then um, had her usual sort of post-op day three bump in creatinine um, that we always see from a little bit of, you know, infivena cava clamping and whatnot, but had nice resolution of her AKI with a creatinine to one, and she was discharged post-op day seven. So great recovery and, and obviously, you know, has done really well with this. So this is sort of what we've what we're striving to do. We're not always successful, but we're trying our best in this. So we then asked ourselves the question, okay, so when we're doing all these things, we're paying attention to volume, we're trying to turn the kidneys around uh, so that these, that these patients do better. Is there any data support to support patient outcomes? And so we started to look at data that were available us to, from hospital data 
And one of the things that we were able to look at was length of stay uh, for liver transplant patients who had acute kidney injury. And what we did is we looked at two different eras. We looked at the pre-KLP area. So this was 2012 to about September of 2016. And then uh, when we launched the service, we looked at the era post-KLP. So this is 2016 to 2021. And what you can see that there is a significant reduction in the length of stay of patients with acute kidney injury by about three days uh, following the implementation of the kidney liver program. This data is also holds true for patients who, who are even sicker than that. So patients who have dialysis, dialysis requiring acute kidney injury, um, again, comparing the pre-KLP area 2012 to 2016 to post-KLP, we can see an almost four-day uh, reduction in the length of stay in patients who require dialysis, longer length of stay for these patients who are sicker. Now, you may argue, well, you know, there's a bunch of other things that change during that time. Maybe your overall length of stay decreased as well. Um, and that ended up not being true. So patients, liver transplant recipients without AKI had essentially the identical length of stay pre and post KLP. So, uh, so it sounds like it really was the patients with AKI and dialysis requiring AKI that benefited from this change, whereas patients in whose care we were not involved in, no improvement. So meaning that maybe we should get involved in that, those patients care as well. Maybe they could do better as well, just kidding. All right, so the third big paradigm shift that we did was we started to aggressively going after ammonia uh, in patients with acute liver failure. Uh, armed with dialysis machines. And really, this is something that was spearheaded by, by Carrie. So what about acute liver failure, or lovingly also referred to as ALF, like our favorite TV character? The two things that kill these patients are, number one, infections, but more importantly, cerebral edema. So here you can see head CTs of a patient who has uh, emerging brainstem herniation, severe cerebral edema. Uh, and that's something that is commonly seen in patients with severe acute liver failure and can kill them very, very quickly. So what Carrie has shown in her renal grand rounds from a few years ago is that if you have severe acute liver failure, formerly re uh, referred to as fulminant hepatic failure, you develop severe hyperaminemia. Um, that leads to swelling of the astrocytes in the brain. They would get poisoned, they start swelling, and that leads to intracranial cranial hypertension and brainstem death. And so we decided um, that, you know, when these patients would hit the MECU, we would immediately get alerted and we would start um, aggressively treating hyperaminemia. So um, what we have started to do is that if patients with acute liver failure have an ammonia level of greater than 200, we will strongly considering, uh, we will strongly consider starting SLED um, these are usually 24-hour sled runs where we're actually targeting an ammonia level of uh, less than 200. So we're not just starting sled, but we're actually tracking serial ammonia levels. And we at times have to rev up our dialysis to high flux dialyzers, high flow rates to get to keep up with the rapid ammonia generation uh, rate in these patients. And here's Nisha, who is uh, in the ICU, um, encouraging us uh, to get going on this. So um, any data to support that this intervention has changed outcomes? Um, this is hospital data where we looked at diagnosis codes in the pre-KLP era on the left, 2012 to 2016, compared to post-KLP. And what we found was the death rate um, had dropped from roughly 10% to about 4%. Its incidence of cerebral edema dropped from 10 to about 4%, and cerebral herniation had gone from 5 to 0%. So this was hospital data. Uh, we were like, wow, okay, this is actually interesting. Um, you know, is this actually true? So along came one of us, our, one of our very talented and wonderful uh, MIC, uh, uh, internal medicine R2s, Dale, Dele uh, Brema. So he's actually a He's going to apply for a renal fellowship, hopefully here at the University of Washington. And he, for some reason, developed a keen interest in an acute liver failure uh, and kidney issues. Um, uh, and, and so he decided to take this a step further. So what Deli and I did, we met with our favorite hepatologist who gave us 
um, all a list of all the, the patients with acute liver failure between 2012 and 2020. And um, he actually started to do a manual chart which, uh, review, which was an enormous amount of work. So he looked at death rates between you know, pre-KLP to post-KLP that dropped from about 33 to 29%, not too bad. Survival seemed to improve from 48 to 52%. Um, roughly a fifth of these patients underwent a liver transplant, so no difference between those two groups. But the incidence of cerebral edema, and this is now chart review looking at CT scans and medical records, dropped from 24 to about 8%, so cut into a third. Uh, and cerebral herniation dropped from about almost 8% to 3%, so almost also cut into a third. So significant improvement here. Um, but more importantly, Delhi then said, okay, what if we look at patients where we have ammonia levels available who have an ammonia level of greater than 200, because those would be the patients that would benefit the most from your services from dialysis. Um, and while there was no difference in patients who underwent liver transplantation, there was um, essentially a 50% uh, reduction in death rate from roughly 40 to about 20%. And survival without transplant improved from about 40 to almost 60%. So significant improvement in survival of patients with hyperaminemia and acute liver failure, hopefully by some of the services we are providing. So to, to get maybe a little bit more of a 360 degree review of the kidney liver program, we decided to launch a survey uh, and we decided to, to send a survey to the other um, people who are involved in, in the patient's care. So um, the survey was sent out to internal medicine hospitalists um, where we had a pretty, I guess the best response rate in the hospitalists um, but the survey was also sent to ICU attendings, to nurses on 7SA, which is the dialysis and transplant unit, to ICU nurses, hepatologists, transplant surgeons, transplant APPs, and ICU APPs. And we had a total of 74 responses to the survey, which we thought was pretty decent. So I wanted to sort of go through some, some of the things we were able to elicit um, in this survey. So uh, when, when we asked providers whether KLP has improved the care of patients with end-stage liver disease, about 85% of providers strongly agreed with that. Um, when we asked them whether KLP has improved the care of patients with liver transplants, um, three quarters of providers strongly agreed with that. Um, when we asked uh, whether KLP has improved the care of patients with acute liver failure, again, about three quarters of patient uh, of providers <laughs> responded and felt uh, that they strongly agreed with that. Um, uh, when posed the question whether KLP has decreased the incidence of cerebral herniation or edema, um, roughly a third of uh, providers were not felt not comfortable to assess that, which makes sense. Um, but um, at least 40% strongly agreed that they felt like we had accomplished that. Um, when asked whether joint rounds with KLP improves case patient communication, again, uh, uh, three quarters of providers uh, agreed, strongly agreed with that. Um, there was evidence to support that joint rounds with KLP improves patient care. A lot of providers strongly agreed with that. Um, and um, particularly the dialysis care for our liver patients, um, patient uh, providers felt like um, had improved significantly um, in three quarters of all providers. There's also evidence to support that KLP has improved continuity of care for these liver patients where three quarters of providers strongly um, agreed with that. Um, when asked whether KLP has reduced or has helped reduce hospital length of stay, um, there was again about a third of providers who felt, didn't feel comfortable to assess that, which again makes sense. Not everybody has insight into that, but about almost half of providers um, strongly agreed with that. What we did at the end of the survey, um, and I have to say, I, I expected almost nothing uh, from that. Is I put a little, we put a little box on the bottom, say, you know, any comments, you know, words of wisdom, things for improvement. So, um, um, and I was surprised that the majority of of providers who took the survey actually took the time to put in little comments on the bottom. 
And when looking at those, um, there was certain themes that emerged. Um, it's not perfectly well organized, like uh, some of the researchers would do. But theme one was improvement in care, where we got comments like undoubtable improved care for our patients in countless ways, amazing program that strongly enhanced patient care. And I promise I didn't bribe any of these people. Stands out as some of the best of UW Medicine, invaluable resource for UW MC, honestly feels like it should be the standard of care, invaluable to length of stay and quality of care, fantastic service. I can't imagine providing the same quality of care without it. There's sort of more on improvement of care, incredible asset to the liver transplant program, tremendous positive impact on patient care and outcomes, shortens length of stay pro, uh, both pre and post, dramatically improved the care of our patients, saved many lives. Holy cow. Liver kidney team is phenomenal. Number of patients who needed to be dialyzed after transplant has tremendously decreased. So theme one, improvement of care. Theme two was improvement of communication, which is something that we had uh, also aimed for. Comments like strong, strongly enhances communication, excellent communication with the nephrologists, helps facilitate communication among the teams, communication with patients and family are consistent. Ease of communication between hepatology and nephrology has improved our ability to provide timely care. Um, more on communication, so the communication with their team is the easiest out of any consulting service. Um, facilitate communication between ICU teams and hepatology transplant teams. Excellent communication with nephrologists. Stands out as some of the best at UW Medicine. This is one of the associate hospital directors. And then kidney liver program enhances patient's care, patient care and communication. So communication seems to have improved. Um, theme three, something that we didn't expect at all to see, um, but there was some you know, evidence to suggest maybe a, a change in job satisfaction. So one of our hospitalists here writes, KLP has made my role more positive. I feel valued and in the loop. It has improved my job satisfaction. I was like, oh, okay, didn't expect that. Kidney liver rounds are one of my favorite parts of this job is another one of the hospitalists here. This is from an ICU nurse. One of the reasons I love taking care of acute liver failure patients. Here's from one of the um, 7SA nurses and as an RN, I'm proud to work the work we do for this unique patient population. And then I feel way more confident about having these experts on board. That's just one of the, from one of the transplant APPs. And then theme four was comments on cerebral herniation. This is the top one is from one of our ICU docs who says, it feels like dialysis for hyperaminemia has changed outcomes. I don't remember the last patient who had uh, cerebral herniation. And uh, the next comment is from one of our hepatologists who says, we have not needed to use ICP monitoring for acute liver patients in years since the start of this team. So some of you remember that these patients had bolts in their heads to measure the, at the ICP. So those are things that have gone away. So um, in summary, um, I hope I have shared some data with you to suggest that uh, KLP may have an impact, uh, may have had an impact on improvement in communication between teams. Um, I hope I've, I've shared some data with you to show that uh, that it improves, may help help improve patient outcomes. Um, we showed some data on uh, reduction of length of stay, uh, which may translate into cost savings and which may hopefully pay for the program. Um, interestingly, uh, didn't expect this, maybe an impact on provider satisfaction, which maybe could even um, improve provider retention. And then what, what I wasn't, wasn't able to get to today because of time constraints is uh, fellow experience. There's a lot of people we need to thank for this. Um, I wanted to start by uh, thanking Kim Yuzinski, who had the vision for the service, who said, you know, listen, this is a patient population that we need to address specifically. So Kim kept talking about it at every section meeting. And then Stuart is the one who really got it off the ground by speaking with hospital administration and creating positions specifically designed for this. So he hired Carrie and, Carrie and me to launch this program. He was helped by Ashley Jefferson, our section head. We've had tremendous support from Raj, who has continued to support our team. Uh, Nisha has been wonderful helping us um, with some of the data uh, generation and analysis. Kerry has been the rock in all of this, launching this program. Without him, it would have been impossible. So Kerry gets a huge amount of thanks. Um, Laura Mayeda has been amazing in, in pitching in. She's on the service this week, and she's done an incredible job. And then um, a second 
uh, thanks to Kim who covers for us as well on the service and leaves no stone, stone unturned and usually points out things that we have missed. Um, so we are grateful to them. And then I wanted to thank Danielle and Alyssa for helping with the survey. Daniela, uh, Danielle was able to put the survey questions into uh, a survey format that then Alyssa sent out and I'm grateful to their help as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, maybe a fourth theme is like job security. Um, <laughs> amazing work. Thanks, especially to you and Carrie for building this, this program over the last years. Uh, and we have several questions. Um, Susan? Uh, Raymond and Carrie, thank you for this program. It is phenomenal. And I think a role model uh, for other programs. I apologize for not turning on my camera. My internet's throttling. Um, but I have a comment as well as a question. Um, one is, I love the work from uh, the, the survey and the qualitative work from, pay, from faculty. Um, I wonder if there's a chance to also ask patients. I think it can be a real sell to administrators, to others, to be able to share like how the patients are benefiting from this improved communication and coordination of care. Um, the, the question I have is, I was also really fascinated by how the model improves communication in a world of incredible fragmentation in the healthcare system. And I wonder, what, what's your hypothesis as to why communication is improved? Is it just the fact that there's two of you rather than chasing down 12 different nephrologists? Um, there's less, you know, that kind of turnover um, among different nephrologists on the service or, or you know, what's, what, what do you have in your model that makes this, you know, this improved, that brings about this improved communication? Yeah, thanks for those questions. So great idea about um, asking patients too. I think that's that's a great thought. We should do that and we'll do that. And maybe for some of the qualitative analysis, um, I would love any kind of insight and help. So I don't know. So improvement of communication. So I feel like the joint rounds helps, right? Because you know, you know who the players are, um, you discuss on rounds. I have to say, the drawback is it's very time consuming, right? You listen to the presentation of the surgical team or or whatnot. Um, but but everybody has their turn to talk um, and discuss issues. So I feel like that improves communication. Um, the other things are things that that you reflected on. It's you know who to call, right? It's the majority of times it's Carrie or me, or now it's Carrie, Laura, uh, and me. So they know exactly who who to call. They have our cell phone numbers and they track us down. The nurses know exactly who to who to flag down. Um, so I feel like sort of having a limited number of providers doing this is has been helpful as well. And then sort of being a known entity, right? Being sort of somebody who is who is there all the time. So they they recognize who you are, right? Um, and, and so they can easily identify you. So I feel like maybe the combination and then having, you know, designated times, not only designated rounding times every day at 8.30, you know, we need to be there, but also having the designated meetings um, with, you know, for instance, with the hospitalists where every Monday and Thursday we get together and we talk. Mm, yeah. This made it a culture that that hepatology, the hepatology attending, and and we will usually touch base. Maybe not every day, but I would say three out of five days a week we touch bases on critically ill patients together with transplant surgery. And sometimes, in you know, if we have a patient with a melt of forty, it will be the transplant surgeon, hepatology, and 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 us going to the bedside in the MICU, seeing these patients together. Right? You have somebody with a melt of forty, you know, an offer is going to come up, so you see them jointly and you talk about them together. Yeah, that's it's so cool to hear that practice creates culture or a good, better culture. So, Nick, thank you. Thank you. I have a bunch more questions. I'm going to keep it to the the three other people who had their hands raised: um, Steve, Leah, and then Suzanne. What an incredible service that you and Carrie and others created. Thank you so much. My uh, my question is uh, about treating possible hepatorenal, and when we see patients who are very stable on the floor but still the creatinine's increased enough and they've gotten the albumin for us to suspect hepatorenal. Should we just stop trying octreotide and minadrin and just send them to the unit and try no repinephrine instead? Yeah, Steve, that's a good question. So it depends depends a little bit on the trajectory and, and acuity. Um, as you alluded to, minadrin and octreotide is far inferior to, to norepinephrine. And I, I feel like only a small portion of patients respond to that, but some of them will. 
So it depends on, on you know, how quickly things are going. For instance, the, the patient I showed you where the creatins are rapid, rapidly escalated to three, I think that was a no-brainer that she needed to go to, to the unit. And I, what, what, we are, uh, what we have learned is, is that there, there seems to be a point of no return with HRS AKI, meaning that the vasoconstriction is so significant. If you don't turn it around in time, um, you're going to have little chance of turning it around later just because to develop ischemic changes over time. So you need to be attentive to catching them early enough. So sometimes there's a patient with maybe sort of HRS CKD or what we used to call type 2 hepatorenal syndrome. So maybe their creatinine is 1, 2, or 1, 3, which is elevated for that patient, but they're still urinating. The creatinine is relatively stable or maybe slowly inching up. So that's maybe a patient where you have a little bit more time where you can say, okay, let's try imidadrine or triotide. Let's mm -hmm. bring those up to the maximal recommended doses and see if there's a response. But you know, if a patient patient's creatinine goes to one to one five to two, right? Um, then, uh, or if they have clear evidence of HRS, AKI, you better get your act together. Mm -hmm. And, and act quickly. And that's going to be in the no, new ATKI recommendations. Uh, I was sort of lucky enough to be invited to be part of that. Um, uh, and, and so the new recommendations are going to, are going to say, you know, are essentially going to say act quickly uh, and then get them into uh, on a vasoconstrictor, be it or norepinephrine as quickly as you can. Mm -hmm. So in, in practice would trying one or two days of octreotide and midodrine and then switching to no repi, would there be a reasonable initial approach until these guidelines? Reasonable, right? But if you have a patient with a creatinine of three uh, who is not, being, then, you know, I think you, you need to immediately jump on it and get them mm -hmm. to do it right then, because then you don't, you don't want to waste time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to wait another 24 hours where you went from the midodrine from five to 10 or 15. You want to jump on these people. So it really depends on the acuity. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Leah. Um, thanks so much, Raymond. Um, I really appreciate your taking us call our calls from Harborview as well when we struggle with these patients. I would say that um, from the perspective of Harborview, um, it's the easier patients are the ones that are liver transplant candidates because the path is clear. And so um, that's really the minority of our patients. And so my question is, we really struggle with decisions regarding offering, offering dialysis, particularly if the diagnosis is HRS versus ATN and we're on the border. And so um, do you have strict criteria for when you um, do or don't offer dialysis for people who are not liver transplant candidates? And should we institute that more globally so that there's consistency between Harborview and the UW on that? Because my sense is that um, that's something that we really struggle with. So. Yeah, Leah, that's, that's, that's a great question. And I think it's one of the biggest challenges that we really struggle with as well. And we're, we're sometimes even amongst ourselves or even within the same provider, we, we, we have inconsistencies uh, when I was a fellow, Kim Muzinski taught me that we don't dialyze patients who have AKI and have end-stage liver disease who are not liver transplant candidates, and they all die. They all die. And then uh, I remember that Karen and I, when we started the service, we were like, "Okay, uh, this is a different era. We we can make it happen." And we, you know, there's some papers suggesting that you know a certain chunk of these patients will live. And then we started to dialyzed patients who look the most robust, maybe somebody with acute ALKEP or somebody who, who is younger and, and maybe is more of a NASH phenotype than, than a super cachectic alcoholic. And I have to say, we, we failed in the vast majority of these patients. Um, so we've become really, we've become really selective um, in patients that we, that we dialyze. And it's usually sort of a, a joint decision between hepatology uh, yeah, and, and obviously the primary teams and us. Um, there is a subset of patients where we will consider a time-limited trial where we feel like there's something acutely reversible, maybe somebody who developed septic sepsis or maybe somebody who had AKI from contrast. But if I have a patient with a MELD of 40 um, who is not a liver transplant candidate, um, it's probably best not to even get started, right? Because otherwise you sort of prolong the inevitable. So, so unfortunately we don't have hard rules. Probably that's something we should work on where we should work better on criteria. So we still make decisions, you know, based on, on every single case. Got it. 
that's what also hepatology feels like, you know, what, what, you know, maybe somebody with acute health, I'll cap who may, you know, turn around with steroids or mucomist or whatever. Right. Right. Thank you. And one more question, Suzanne. A oh, quick comment, a quick question. So first of all, Raymond, this is just fantastic to see the journey through creating this service. So, you know, at OHSU in the Portland VA, we had very robust liver transplant programs. And about a third of our inpatient service was actually around patients with liver dysfunction and kidney concerns. It was the number one dissatisfier for fellows um, over year after year after year, which you alluded to at the end of your talk. Um, the In fact, and the communication might not have been optimal, I'd even posit that uh, maybe there was a little bit of tension between the nephrology group and the uh, hepatology group and the surgeons. And so it seems like you've really traversed that and made this a better experience. Um, I have a feeling that there are many places around the country that would really um, benefit from something like this. Um, have you, my quick question is, have you considered like doing any consulting or, you know, really talking to other, starting out with academic centers, for example, it would be a place where, you know, we might be a, a real national leader um, and could bring additional value to the uh, division. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. So very similar to your experience, I think it was also a huge drag for our fellows. Um, and I think it's what really sort of was one of the reasons why Kim started um, started to uh, recommend to start this service. Um, it, it's a great idea. I think we're currently, I think the next step is to write this up and um, and Nisha has kindly um, uh, set up um, that that she thinks we can publish this in Kidney 360. So I think that would be one step of getting the word out. Um, we have not thought about consulting <laughs> on this. Would be happy to if, if there's a need. Um, I have to say I'm I'm, I'm on a regular uh, basis communicating with uh, with Mitra Nadim from USC, who's one of the national leaders on this, and she, um, you know, for instance, in, invited me to join the ATKI. Uh, uh, meeting just to to chime in on some of these issues, but I think it is unique, uh, and I have to say it was really the vision of Kim, the leadership of Stuart, uh, Ashley, and Raj, who has who has allowed us to 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 create this right. And it's it's not the biggest RVU generator, right? So it's something that obviously is is not terribly attractive to 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 those hospital administrators who who look at RVUs and and, and so forth because it's very time consuming. So each patient takes an enormous amount of time and you can't recoup all that. Right, but knowing that it might really add, given that they probably do want the liver transplant um, business, um, I, I think that you know the case can be made. So it'll be great for you to publish this. Well, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everyone's great discussion um, and to three excellent speakers today. Uh, looking forward to seeing everyone in person um, next week at South Lake Union. Have a good weekend. Thank you.